Today I saw this article that read, Intermittent Fasting Completely Reverses Type 2 Diabetes. So of course I checked it out and I wanted to see what the actual study showed, which was published here in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. But before we get to that study, we need a little context to understand the common thread between type 2 diabetes, metabolic health, and intermittent fasting. Tell me if you've heard this story before. Let's say we have a 45 year old guy, we'll call him John. John is overweight and his waist circumference is 40 inches. He goes to the doctor's office and he's seen for 15 minutes at an annual checkup by his primary care physician who comments that the patient has gained 15 pounds in the last year. So the doctor tells John that he should try to reduce his weight by cutting back on calories and exercising regularly. So John is scheduled for another checkup in one year, but by that time he gains 12 more pounds. John's doctor orders blood work and the results show that he has elevated insulin and glucose levels and an elevated hemoglobin A1C level Let's say that hemoglobin A1C level of 6.0%, which indicates prediabetes. Now the doctor again simply consoles the patient to lose weight and schedules a follow-up visit six months later. By then, the patient's fasting glucose level is 150, a normal level would be less than 100, and his hemoglobin A1C is now, guess what? It's 6.5%, which means he's now in diabetes range, so he's considered a diabetic. Based on conversations with Jennifer, the pharmaceutical company representative who periodically visits the doctor's office, well, she talks to the doctor and now the doctor is prescribing John a new expensive diabetes drug. Let's say Jennifer tells the doctor about that new drug called semaglutide or semaglutide if you prefer, the one that has been making headlines as a weight loss drug based on the recent study that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Semaglutide is a once weekly injection drug that causes weight loss in obese and overweight people. On average, it causes people to lose 15% of their body weight. Well, to clarify, the people who received this drug in this study, they also exercised and they reduced their caloric intake, so it wasn't just the drug causing the weight loss. What is noteworthy is that the researchers excluded all people with type 2 diabetes in this study. And I'll get to why that has a huge significance in a bit. Regardless, the study participants who received semaglutide in this study also had greater improvements compared to the placebo group with respect to cardiometabolic risk factors, including reductions in waist circumference, blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C levels, and lipid levels. Overall, it is a pretty safe drug, at least in the short term. The most common side effects were nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and it was rare that someone had to quit the study because of the side effects. Strengths of this trial included the large sample size and the very high rates of adherence to the treatment regimen. Limitations of this study included the relatively short duration of the trial and the fact that they excluded those people with type 2 diabetes. Why is it so significant that these study participants were overweight or obese but did not have type 2 diabetes? Everyone thinks that you get sick as a result of gaining weight, but the reality is 80% of the time it's actually the opposite. First you get sick from a metabolic standpoint, and then you gain the weight. In fact, 20% of obese people are in fact metabolically healthy. So if you randomly put 100 obese people in a room, 20 of them will be metabolically healthy. And the medical term for this is called MHO, or metabolically healthy obesity. And because they are metabolically healthy, generally speaking, they have normal lifespans with normal length telomeres. These people have lots of subcutaneous fat, but very little ectopic fat, meaning fat in cells that shouldn't have fat, like liver cells. They also have normal metabolic function and low insulin levels. Now maybe you're wondering, what is metabolically healthy and what is metabolically unhealthy? Metabolically unhealthy is metabolic syndrome, meaning the inappropriate storage of energy in the wrong form in the cells that shouldn't be storing it. There's only three types of cells in the body that should be storing energy. One is fat tissue, so fat cells called adipocytes, which store excess energy in the form of fat. Two is muscle tissue, and three is liver tissue. So both liver tissue and muscle tissue are supposed to store excess energy in the form of glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose. Fat that is stored anywhere outside of fat cells is called ectopic fat. So if the muscle or liver or even the pancreas end up storing ectopic fat, guess what happens? Those tissues develop metabolic dysfunction and they start to malfunction. What about the 80% of overweight and obese people who are metabolically unhealthy? They didn't gain the weight and then become sick. 
they became metabolically ill first as a result of developing high insulin levels, which led to insulin resistance, and that's what caused the weight gain. But since their fat cells still responded to the insulin, despite most of the cells in the body being resistant to insulin, well, that means that the extra insulin told those fat cells to store more energy, so those fat cells got bigger and bigger. And what if you're not overweight or obese? Let's say you're thin. Well, if you're thin, that must mean that you're metabolically healthy, right? Not necessarily, because thin people can be tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. In fact, 40% of normal weight people have tofi, which is to say that they have some degree of metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, and high insulin levels. But for whatever reason, they're just not obese. Now in some of them, their fat cells are in fact insulin resistant, so energy isn't really stored excessively in the subcutaneous tissue. Now why are some people have fat cells that are more insulin resistant than others? That remains to be determined. So where does the excess energy go? It ends up getting stored as ectopic fat in organs that shouldn't be storing fat like liver, muscle, and sometimes pancreas. So what you really wanna pay attention to is the degree of ectopic fat inside the body which is of course the fat that you can't see because it's on the inside. So the people in this study who received semaglutide, who were all overweight or obese, and none of them had type two diabetes, it's likely that most of them, if not all of them, were MHO, metabolically healthy obesity. So the bottom line is you can't always tell if someone is metabolically healthy or not by simply looking at them, because if they're thin, they may or may not have TOFI, and if they're obese, they may or may not be MHO. But getting back to John, whether he's prescribed semaglutide or metformin or whatever drug to try to improve his type 2 diabetes, is that really fixing the underlying problem? Well, no, because drugs aren't going to fix the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is eating too much of the unhealthy foods and not enough of the healthy food. In other words, eating too much processed food because it's the processed food that has all the added sugar and the refined carbohydrates, which is the main driver of high insulin levels and insulin resistance. Exercise helps as well because exercise stimulates the enzyme AMP kinase and you end up improving insulin sensitivity. And then there's the other thing that also stimulates AMP kinase and improves insulin sensitivity, and that is intermittent fasting. In fact, when you look at the biochemistry and the physiology and the health benefits of exercise and compare that to intermittent fasting, they're virtually identical. Both of these stimulate autophagy where the cell repairs itself and both of these stimulate mitophagy where the mitochondria are replenished. Cells increase the number and the size of mitochondria. When people exercise and they do intermittent fasting, either one, but especially synergistically, cells increase the number and the size of mitochondria. You're only as healthy as your mitochondria and that's really what it boils down to. So what does intermittent fasting do to someone with type two diabetes? Well, when insulin binds to its receptor on the surface of a cell, it normally stimulates the glucose transporter proteins in the cell membrane. The glucose transporter proteins move glucose from the outside of the cell to the inside, where the cell can then use that glucose to make ATP. Remember, it's the mitochondria that are making that ATP. Now, in someone with type 2 diabetes, insulin binds to its receptor, but the receptor is unable to stimulate glucose transport. Because blood glucose levels are abnormally high in this case, the pancreas produces more insulin, so patients with type 2 diabetes have elevated amounts of insulin in their bloodstream. Type 2 diabetes, it used to only affect adults, but now it's become increasingly calming in children, or at the very least, adolescents. It's been well established in numerous studies that type 2 diabetes can be prevented and even reversed with exercise and improving the diet. So the results of the recent randomized controlled trials suggest that intermittent fasting is also highly effective in restoring the cell's ability to respond to insulin, meaning making it more sensitive, thereby reducing the risk of diabetes and even reversing type 2 diabetes in some cases. In a randomized controlled trial in Australia, 63 patients with type 2 diabetes who did the 5 to 2 intermittent fasting for 3 months demonstrated significant reductions in hemoglobin A1C levels, although it takes at least a few weeks to see that improvement. Even for those who won't exercise or can't exercise, intermittent fasting still can improve and normalize their ability to keep glucose and insulin levels within normal limits. So with this context in mind, this study just came out. There were a total of 72 people in this study. The study participants were between the ages of 38 and 72, and they all had type 2 diabetes, anywhere from one year to 11 years in duration. They were also randomly allocated based on the anti-diabetic medications, including those who were taking insulin. So half of them went into the control group and then the other half went into the treatment group, which was the intermittent fasting with caloric restriction group. 
They called this group the Chinese Medical Nutrition Therapy. 36 people in each group, and the primary outcome was diabetes remission. So they wanted to see if this could reverse the diabetes. And they defined that as having a hemoglobin A1C level of less than 6.5% for at least three months after stopping all anti-diabetic medications. The secondary outcomes included hemoglobin A1C1 levels, fasting blood glucose levels, blood pressure, weight loss, and quality of life. They also did a 12-month follow-up to assess the continuation of remission. In other words, one year later, were they still in remission? So here's what they found. 17 out of the 36 participants in the treatment group, so 47%, achieved diabetes remission compared to just one person in the control group. The average body weight of participants in the CMT group, so the treatment group, was reduced by 6 kilograms, about 15 pounds, compared to just less than 1 pound in the control group. After the 12-month follow-up, 44% of the participants continued to stay in remission with a hemoglobin A1C level of 6.3%. Not to mention, the medication cost of the treatment group was 77% lower than that of the control group. And here are some other huge takeaways from the study. Almost 90% of the participants, including those who were taking anti-diabetes medications, those who took insulin, they reduced their diabetes medication requirements after doing the intermittent fasting. 55% of these people experienced diabetes remission, discontinued their diabetes medication, and maintained that for at least one year. And results of this study challenged the conventional view that diabetes remission can only be achieved in those with a shorter diabetes duration, typically defined as zero to six years. Well, two thirds of those who achieved diabetes remission in this study actually had diabetes for more than six years. So that's pretty impressive. It just goes to show that it really boils down to doing things that decrease those insulin levels and improving insulin sensitivity. So it's well known that a healthy diet and regular exercise do these quite well. And that's why they're essential for diabetes control. And now we have evidence that intermittent fasting can do the same and even reverse type two diabetes. And this is what I've been saying in previous videos is that the best things that you can do for your metabolic health are the big three, exercise, fasting, and eating healthy food meaning real food that is unprocessed, real food that has insoluble fiber and no added sugar. And if you're someone who does intermittent fasting, I especially want to hear about your experience in the comments below. Thanks for watching.